But now let's move on because foreign ministers from 20 countries have been meeting in Canada to try to exert concerted pressure on North Korea to give up its nuclear ambitions. The group is made up solely of countries which were involved in the Korean War more than a half a century ago, but two key international players, uh, North Korea's neighbours, Russia and China, are, are not there. Well, at a news conference, uh, Rex Tillerson uh, said the US is open to talks with North Korea, but only if it stops its threatening behavior. The United States has always been open to clear messages that North Korea, and we have sent clear messages to North Korea that we are ready for serious negotiations. North Koreans know our channels are open and they know where to find us. But a sustained cessation of North Korea's threatening behavior is necessary is a necessary indicator of whether the regime is truly ready to pursue a peaceful diplomatic resolution to the security threat that it has created. Our nations must remain united on sustaining pressure until North Korea takes concrete steps toward and ultimately reaches denuclearization. Well, Canada's foreign minister also had quite a bit to say about this, saying all 20 countries agreed sanctions on North Korea. They would be uh, strictly enforced. The 20 nations represented here in Vancouver have agreed that we must work together to ensure that sanctions imposed on North Korea are strictly enforced. We also agree that we must take significant steps to keep North Korea from invading sanctions and to sever financial lifelines for the country's weapons of mass destruction. I do want to say clearly that we, as a group, harbor no hostility whatsoever towards North Korea or its people. We seek neither a regime change nor a collapse. What we do want is to resolve this crisis peacefully, to achieve what is in our collective best interests, and that is security and stability on the Korean Peninsula. 20 countries have called for the strict enforcement of sanctions against North Korea in the latest bid to curb its nuclear ambitions. Well, let's get more on that now. Uh, Sophie Long is in Seoul uh, for us. Sophie, this is quite interesting timing, isn't it? Because you and I have been talking about these very delicate talks going on between North and South Korea, and yet, Am I right in saying there were representatives from South Korea in Vancouver as well? Yes, exactly. It is uh, very interesting and I think a real illustration of the, of the several levels of diplomacy that is taking place at the moment. So we've had this meeting of 20 nations in Vancouver who have been looking at ways to get uh, Pyongyang, to get North Korea to the negotiating table and talk about denuclearization. At the same time, today in the denuclearization, the militarized zone that separates North and South Korea. There are working level talks talking about getting the Pyongyang delegation to the Winter Olympics. And um, I think what we saw today in Vancouver is this uh, sense of solidarity, both the United States and South Korean representatives using the same language that the denuclearization of North Korea must be complete, it must be verifiable, and it must be irreversible, and that a nuclear armed North Korea is not acceptable. So a real show that the United States and South South Korea are on the same page. Now, we haven't yet got any reaction from North Korea to that, but when uh, Moon Jae-in, the South Korean president, came out after the initial high-level, government-level talks, the first of those to take place between North and South Korea for two years, he stood there the day afterwards and said he credited Donald Trump with helping to get these new inter-Korean talks going. That was not received very well in South Korea. There have been several, uh, North Korea, sorry, there's been several articles in the state-run press there sort of criticizing Moon Jae-in for saying that and saying that they won't take kindly to anyone pouring cold water on this new uh, phase of what they're calling potential reconciliation. So it's an illustration really also of just how, how tight the, uh, the path that the South Korean government must tread here. They need to keep their, their international allies on side while at the same time trying to engage North Korea in genuine dialogue. But many are wondering, you know, what impact this meeting in Vancouver is going to have given the fact that China and Russia are not there. Exactly. So this is a meeting of 20 nations. Neither China nor Russia are 
were present at that meeting. Now, one of the things they discussed is how to implement the sanctions that are already in place. There are several rounds of fairly hard economic sanctions imposed against North Korea, the last of which came into effect in December. Now, in the past weeks, there have been accusations that Chinese and um, Russian ships have been helping North Korea to evade those sanctions by carrying out ship-to-ship -ship transfers of oil, which violates the sanctions. Both the Chinese and Russian authorities deny that. But both uh, countries have expressed their discontent and not being at this meeting. Uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, said it, it, was, it was destructive. And uh, a Chinese uh, foreign ministry spokesperson has been telling reporters, how can you expect to sort out the North Korean nuclear issue when important parties to that issue are not present? All right, Sophie, for now, thank you very much indeed. I know I will talk to Sophie again soon. Now, let's take you... We begin with a high-stakes international meeting here in Vancouver and what to do about North Korea. We seek neither a regime change nor a collapse. What we do want is to resolve this crisis peacefully, to achieve what is in our collective best interests. We will not accept a nuclear-armed North Korea. We are ready for serious negotiations. North Koreans know our channels are open and they know where to find us. Chrissy Freeland and Rex Tillerson side by side tonight as foreign ministers from around the world wrapped up an unprecedented meeting and applied more pressure on North Korea and its nuclear ambitions. Katie Simpson now on whether the meeting will actually address the threat facing the international community. Standing united, foreign ministers in Vancouver delivered a warning to North Korea. Stop your weapons development or face more isolating punishments. Investing in nuclear weapons will lead only to more sanctions and to perpetual instability on the peninsula. Delegates from 20 countries agreed today to continue a coordinated pressure campaign against North Korea through sanctions. We must increase the cost of the regime's behavior to the point that North Korea comes to the table for credible negotiations. Despite agreement around the table, no new measures were announced, aside from Canada investing $3 million in a sanctions enforcement training program. It would help if Russia and China were involved in this meeting, because we can't enforce the sanctions without China particularly, and Russia also. Neither China nor Russia were invited to the summit, which has led to skepticism about how much impact the talks will have. But some argued diplomacy may already be working, since North and South Korea recently reopened talks for the first time in two years. Despite the long absence, I have to report that the dialogue has been rather productive and positive. The new dialogue is a welcome break in the illegal weapons testing carried out by North Korea. But Kim Jong-un's motives are being questioned. I believe that North Korea wants to buy some time to continue their nuclear and missile programs. They simply want to get something out of this dialogue. Katie Simpson is here in Vancouver. And so, Katie, the big question, is anything expected to change as a result of these talks? In the short term, Ian, no. Consider this a warning shot that if North Korea doesn't stop its weapons development, it will be slapped with even more sanctions. For immediate changes, these countries really need to get China and Russia on board with the plan to make sure those sanctions are being fully enforced. But it doesn't look like Moscow or Beijing want to do more on that front since they've been openly criticizing this meeting for about a week now. Interesting that the site of these talks was in Canada. What does this country get by, by being a co-host? Well, this kind of gathering certainly doesn't hurt Canada's reputation on the world stage. But the Canadian government, at its core, truly believes diplomacy has to be the way out of this. And while U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, who is the co-host, he believes that too, not everyone in the White House is so supportive. So this summit today helps Tillerson drive that message home to the Trump administration that America's allies want diplomacy and perhaps they should give it more time to develop. All right, Katie, thank you. And as we just heard, notably absent at this Vancouver gathering, China and Russia, two key players that not only share land borders with North Korea, but are also Kim Jong-un's main allies. Besides the co-hosts, Canada and the United States, there are also senior officials from 18 other nations here in Vancouver. 
Some you'd expect, such as South Korea and Japan, but others that might surprise you. Keep in mind, the guest list is made up of countries that contributed troops or equipment to the United Nations side of the Korean War from 1950 to 53. That's why Greece, Norway, and Colombia are in, and China and Russia, which backed the North during the war, are not. China, North Korea's main trading partner, reacted angrily to not having a seat at the table, calling it Cold War thinking to involve only those allies which supported the South decades ago. Beijing dismissing the meeting as meaningless without them, claiming it could even destabilize the region and create divisions within the international community. This morning, China blasted the international community on state-run TV just as the talks began in Vancouver. Unity on the issue is extremely important, this news bulletin said. Russia has gone a step further. Its foreign minister condemning the summit as harmful and destructive.